Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to LSE for this hybrid event. My name is Deborah James, and I'm a professor in the Department of Anthropology and a faculty associate at the International Inequalities Institute here at LSE. I'm very pleased to be able to welcome here Professor Alpa Shah, Professor Christophe Jaffalo, Professor Tawun Kaitan, and Priyanka Kotamraju to our online audience and our audience here in the auditorium today. So just to introduce all our speakers, Alpa is Professor of Anthropology at the London School of Economics, this place, and Political Science. Her last book, Night March, was a finalist for the Orwell Prize for Political Writing, New Statesman Book of the Year, finalist for the New India Foundation Book Prize, and winner of the Association for Political and Legal Anthropology Book Prize. But even out, out doing that, her new book, which is what we're here to hear about today, the Incarcerations, BK16 and the Search for Democracy in India um, is very, very, already quite widely um, applauded. It's on the Financial Times What to Read in 2024 list. It was published in the UK and India simultaneously about 10 days ago and has been making many waves. New Statesman has already published an interview and there's reviews in various places, the Times, Telegraph, etc. In India, it became an Amazon bestseller shortly after publication and number one in several categories. So we're looking forward very much to listening to um, this. And Alpa tells me it's also reached the jails, and that's what matters to her the most. Christophe Jaffrelo is Avanta Chair and Professor of Indian Politics and Sociology at the King's Inst India Institute, and also the research lead for the Global Institutes at King's College London. Um, Tarun Kaitan joined LSE as Professor in Public Law in 2023. Previously, he was a Professor of Public Law and Legal Theory at Oxford and the Head of Research at the Bonavero Institute of Human Rights in Oxford. And Priyanka Kotamraju is an Atlantic Fellow for Social and Economic Equity and an independent journalist from India with nearly a decade of experience in the media industry focused on issues of social justice, gender inequality. She's also a PhD candidate in sociology and a Gates Cambridge Scholar at the University of Cambridge. So, just a few housekeeping things. If you're a Twitter user, the hashtag for today's event is hashtag LSEIII. The event's being recorded and will hopefully be made available as a podcast subject to no technical difficulties. As usual, there'll be a chance for you to put questions to the speakers. If you're an online member of the audience, you can submit your questions via the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Please let us know whether you're in the audience or online what your name and affiliation is. We're keen to hear from students and alumni, so please do let us know. For those of you here in the theatre, I'll let you know when we'll open the floor for questions. Please raise your hand and when I indicate you can pose your question. As usual, please provide your name and affiliation. Um, and I'll try to ensure a range of questions from right across the online and the audience here in the theatre. And following the event, you'll be able to buy signed copies of the book outside um, the theatre. So now I'm delighted to hand over to Professor Al Kashar. today and uh, helping us uh, launch this book into the world from the LSC. Um, it's a real honor to be here with this amazing panel. Um, I thank you all for coming today, especially for it, Christophe from <coughs> France. Um, Deborah was my teacher uh, in LSC anthropology, so I'm just delighted that she's sharing this event today. Um, so I'm just going to speak for about 25 to 30 minutes. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of a reading from the book. Um, and then I'm going to hand over to Christoph, Priyanka, and Tarun, who are going to draw out different aspects of the book. It's a big book. Um, and it's covering many aspects of India's democratic collapse. Um, and it's told through the story of one case, the Bhima Koregaon case. Um, 
So the world's largest democracy is about to hold um, general elections and Prime Minister Narendra Modi is slated to win a third term in power and consolidate the long-term vision of his Bharatiya Janta Party and a wider family of organizations known as the Sangh Parivar to make India, India into a Hindu state. Uh, Prime Minister Modi now presents India not only as the world's <coughs> largest democracy, but also the mother of democracy, seeking to displace Greece as the birth of democracy in the public imagination. But critics have pointed out that India is now one of the world's worst autocracies, is authoritarian, and some have even called it a fascist state. There's been a steady erosion of democratic freedoms, including freedom of expression, media independence, and civil liberties. Many of the institutions of the state have been taken over, and crucially, there's a very close pact between corporate capital. Um, inequality is rising. The wealthiest 10% own more than 40% of the total, sorry, more than 70% of the total wealth of the country. According to Thomas Piketty, India is now the most unequal country in the world. My book centers this case, the Pima Koregaon case, which, has, is, which is in some ways a kind of bellwether for the collapse of democracy in India. For it shows the very multiple facets of the takeover of an idea of India, a secular, democratic, even socialist idea that was imagined at the time of in, uh, when India gained independence from British rule, an idea that has been fought for and defended over many years and across institutions and on the ground into the far corners of the country. In telling what is a, a thrilling, chilling, and shocking story of the Bhima Koregao case in which 16 human rights defenders have been incarcerated, most of them are still in prison, the book provides a window onto this, the erosion of democracy, and it shows what the fight for democracy entails on the ground. So let me begin by giving you a flavor of the book by reading a, a passage um, from it. Sorry, thanks, Deborah. Um, so on the evening of the 16th of October 2020, Stan Swami, an 83-year-old Jesuit priest, widely known amongst his friends as a gentle giant who had devoted his life to fighting for the rights of indigenous people. I've got a picture of Stan somewhere. Where is he? There he is. Um, Stan's changed from his shirt and trousers into a comfortable lungi. He's wearing that right there over there. Um, he settled down before dinner, as he always did, to watch news in the common room at Bagecha, where he lived on the outskirts of Ranchi City in the eastern Indian state of Jharkhand. In that garden, so that, that's Bagecha over there, that's what Bagecha means, Stan had finally, over the course of the decade before, created a space that had no signs of the church but instead reflected the spirit of the local indigenous communities, the Adivasis, a space in which everyone would feel welcome. The building at Bagecha was an open U-shape with every door opening into a verdant garden of indigenous plants and trees, in the middle of which was a big meeting and dancing circle representing an Adivasi village. About three days before that fated October evening, a kind of glow had appeared on Stan's face. He was serene, he was collected and calm, as though he had a premonition of what was to come. In contrast, Father Solomon, Stan's companion at Bagecha, was agitated. A week before, Solomon had received a call from the superintendent of police of the National Investigation Agency, the Central Anti-Terror Task Force, and was told to produce Stan at their Mumbai office on the 5th of October, 2020. What do you mean produce Stan? Produce him for what? And why Mumbai? Solomon had asked the superintendent. Stan suffered from various illnesses. Solomon informed the superintendent. He had severe Parkinson's disease, lumbar spondylitis, his hearing was impaired in both ears, and he was still recovering from a second hernia operation. 
It was not possible to take a sick elderly person as far away as Mumbai in the middle of a pandemic, Solomon had told the superintendent. It was simply cruel. On the evening of the 8th of October, Solomon left Stan to go out to buy fruit at the local bazaar when his phone rang. Stan whispered down the line, where are you? The NIA police officers are here. When Solomon returned to Bagatia, two SUVs were parked outside. Under the stairs in the communal seating area, there were four officials from the NIA anti-terror task force and two security guards with big guns. The officer in charge told Solomon to get ready. They wanted to take Stan to the NIA office in Ranchi for questioning by their senior officers. Solomon was angry. If you have all come by car, why couldn't your senior officers also come by car to take Stan? To talk to Stan. Why do you want an 83-year-old sick man away to, to take him away during a pandemic? And why have you come at night? The officer in charge threatened Solomon. If you try and block our work, we can arrest you too. At that point, Stan took Solomon aside and said, enough is enough, I go. Stan's face was calm, graceful, peaceful. A sense of silence had entered him. He had become quiet, withdrawn. It was as though he had taken an internal decision. Stan had already packed his worldly belongings. In a small gray shoulder bag, he had placed some clothes, his one identity document, ironically an election card, and a steel sipper with a straw without which he could not drink because his Parkinson's disease made his hand, hands shake too much to raise a cup steadily to his lips. Stan had been preparing for his arrest for a few months. He had drawn up a will and, to the horror of his friends, had decided to undergo a fast unto death if arrested. Solomon was very worried. Stan's last meal had been rice dal and a vegetable curry eaten with yogurt at noon. He knew that Stan was strong-willed and would refuse any meal given to him thereafter. But there was nothing Solomon could do now. Frail and disoriented, with the pandemic raging outside and after a tiring flight from Ranchi, Stan could barely stand, said Susan Abraham, who met him at the Mumbai court, as she was part of the defense team of lawyers involved in the BK case. We got him to sit on the chair where lawyers sit so that he had table support to put his signature on a few vakaltanamas. These are documents for empowering a lawyer to act on one's behalf. He could barely manage a scroll for a signature, so we had to take his thumb impression, Susan recounted. The defense team sought Stan's release on bail on medical grounds. It was evident for everyone to see that he could not walk, hear, eat, or drink without support, Susan said. His medical papers were presented to the NIA judge, but even for an ailing, aged, infirm man, they didn't consider bail. Stan asked for permission to speak to the judge, and he was allowed into the witness box. Stan said, I neither had any connection with the Bhima Koregao incident, nor any link with Maoists. All along, I dedicated my life for the development of my poor Adivasi sisters and brothers. I wanted justice to be done to them, as per the constitutional provisions and Supreme Court judgments. Stan's voice was so feeble that the judge could not even hear it. Stan was fatally sent to jail, but nevertheless, his voice went viral. His friends spread a video recorded at Bagatia two days before his arrest. Looking straight at the camera, wearing a simple white check cotton shirt, Stan spoke slowly, carefully, and sincerely. What is happening to me is not something unique or happening to me alone. It is a broader process taking place all over the country. We are all aware how prominent intellectuals, lawyers, writers, poets, activists, students' leaders are all put in jail because they have expressed their dissent or raised questions about the ruling powers of India. So we are a part of a process. And in a way, I am happy to be part of this process because I'm not a silent spectator, but I am part of it, part of the game. I am ready to pay the price, whatever be it. Stan's health deteriorated rapidly in prison. The jail authorities did not even have the decency to give Stan the sipper cup he had packed in order to be able to drink water. 
Stan got weaker as the days got by. He was finally moved to the jail, by the jail authorities to a hospital in the coastal suburbs of Bandra in Mumbai, tested post positive for COVID-19 at the end of May 2021, and had a cardiac arrest just before he died. His requested plea for bail on health grounds was never granted. Stan took his last breath at 1.30 p.m. on the 5th of July, 2021. The cruelty with which Stan was treated by the police, the courts, and the jail authorities mean that many have called his death a judicial murder. The United Nations Working Group on Arbitrary Detention found Stan Swamy's detention was discriminatory based on his status as a human rights defender and that his death was utterly preventable. Stan's case is perhaps best known outside of India because of his tragic death and the work that went around his case internationally but he was only the 16th of the BK-16. The homes of most of the BK-16 in Delhi in the north, I've got a little map to show where they were, Delhi in the north, Hyderabad in the south, Mumbai in the west, and Ranchi in the east, were simultaneously raided by the Pune police in 2018. Computers and electronic devices were seized. Five people were arrested and incarcerated in June that year. Others followed. In the international press conferences on the case, sorry, in the initial press conferences on the case, the police waved letters they had allegedly found on the computers of those incarcerated, including one that they claimed was about plotting to kill the Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi. They also said that the BK-16 incited riots on 1st of January 2018 at a place called Bhima Koregao in Maharashtra from where the BK acronym emerges. There, hundreds of thousands of Dalits, India's formerly untouchable communities, were to gather as they do every year at a British-built war memorial to commemorate the bicentenary of the Battle of Bhima Koregao. This 1818 battle of Koregao had been the last battle against the upper caste Peshawar Empire which had allowed the East India Company to consolidate rule over India. But Dalits, whose ancestors were a regiment in the British Army, now celebrate this battle as their victory over upper caste in India. On 1st January 2018, Dalits were arriving at this annual celebration and they were violent, violently attacked. Cars and vehicles were burned, houses and restaurants were destroyed, and one person died. My book, The Incarcerations, charts how videos, photos, and testimonies show that the attacking mob were in fact waving saffron flags, colors of the ruling party, and supported its ideology of Hindutva, of Hindu supremacism. Indeed, one of the two Hindutva instigators of the riots was initially imprisoned, so these are the two, um, uh, the, the one at the bottom was arrested, um, but soon after he was released. The Maharashtra police started new investigations which led to the incarcerations of the BK-16. The incarcerations delves deep into the lives of the BK-16, many of whom I know as colleagues before, or I knew as colleagues before they were arrested. And it asks why were they so dangerous and what the case reveals about the rise of authoritarianism and the collapse of democracy in India. It shows how Stan Swami had stood against attempts, attempts to grab the lands of Adivasis and turn their forests into open caste mines. India's richest mineral reserves of iron ore, bauxite, coal lie under Adivasi lands. Stan had nurtured many indigenous rights activists in the eastern Indian state of Jharkhand to use the constitution to fight for their rights. Among the corporations who found it hard to open plants in Jharkhand was, Ad was the Adani group belonging to Gautam Adani, Modi's favorite oligarch. This is the same Adani group whose Adani Green Energy Gallery has just, right now, opened at London Science Museum this week to huge protests from environmental and climate activists. Just before his arrest, Stan Swamy had also filed a public interest litigation against the Jharkhand state for how holding thousands of poor Adivasis, Dalits, and other minorities in prison for years without trial as alleged terrorists. 
Ironically, he was fighting against the misuse of the same anti-terror laws under which he was imprisoned. Let me also give you a very quick snapshot of the others. Like Stan Swamy, several of the others were also working on indigenous rights and against land grabs by multinational corporations for mining. For instance, there was the 57-year-old lawyer, trade, trade unionist, and visiting professor at the National Law University, Sudha Paradwaj, who, like Stan, had shed her upper caste privileges and devoted her life to working on labor and land rights in the, neighbor, in the neighboring Chhattisgarh state and inspiring many other human rights and environmental activists and lawyers to do the same. Or there was Mahesh Raut. Sorry, I'll, I'll put all of them up. Mahesh Raut, that's him there in the forest with the mic. Um, he was a grassroots forest rights a democracy activist, just 31 years old, who was mobilizing Adivasis against iron ore mining in the forest of Maharashtra state. Or Surendra Gadling, up in the top right corner, also based in Maharashtra, a 47-year-old human rights lawyer who was a Dalit and had inspired and nurtured several Dalit human rights lawyers. Over the decades, he had successfully fought the cases of many Adivasis, Dalits, and other minorities imprisoned in Maharashtra without trial under draconian anti-terror laws. There was, too, the 46-year-old Delhi-based Rona Wilson, also a prisoner's rights activist and researcher. 44-year-old Arun Ferreira, in, in the foreground, was also a human rights lawyer and wrote and illustrated a politics column in an online magazine with his friend, the 60-year-old Vernon Gonzalez, also incarcerated. Among the professors, aside from Sudha Bhardwaj, there was also 59-year-old Shoma Sen, head of Department of English Literature, Nagpur University, a women's rights activist, also advocating for Dalits and Adivasis, Hani Babu, a 54-year-old associate professor of the Department of English, Delhi University, had fought to make the campus more democratic for Adivasis, Dalits, and Muslims. And there was Anand Teltunde, right down there, um, internationally, an internationally known Dalit professor, author of many books and articles on caste and capitalism, Ambedkar and the Im Impact of Hindutva, who had a regular column in one of India's most well-regarded journals, Economic and Political Weekly. Those of you who are from the LSC will recognize that that picture is taken at the LSC. It's of the Ambedkar bust at LSC. That's when he was visiting us on one of his many visits um, to talk about Dalit issues in India. Several of others of the BK-16 worked for the Dalit cause. So there was the Kabir Kala Manch, which was a troop of bards who sang powerful songs against caste oppression and inequality. And that, that included Jyoti Jagdap, this lady here, Sagar Gorke and Ramesh Gaichor, who were all in their 30s when arrested. There's also the Dalit poet, writer, and publisher, Sudhir Dhawale, in his 50s. Other, others, other poets included the 78-year-old Varvara Rao from Hyderabad, a translator, writer, literary critic, and activist. And there was Gautam Navlaka, a journalist of the Economic and Political Weekly for three decades, author of two books on insurgency and counterinsurgency. Since the late 80s, Navlaka had drawn attention to the human rights abuses by state counterinsurgency forces on Muslims in Kashmir, later in the northeast of India, and then in the Adivasi forests of the center. In short, in different ways in different parts of the country, the BK-16 worked for the democratic rights of a broad spectrum of India's most marginalized communities, Adivasis, Dalits, and Muslims. Now, India has a long and robust tradition of such democratic rights activists, organizations, and social movements who do, do not belong to any political party who do not accept external funding, and who have fought for economic and social justice regardless of the regime in power. These are people who have tried to uncover the hidden truths behind atrocities in the far corners of the country, supported grassroots people's movements against injustice and inequality. In one single case, the incarceration of the BK-16 enabled the targeting of all such democratic rights activists in India and that's how it became a bellwether for the collapse of democracy in India. 
Now, there have been many, many violations of human rights in this case, but let me summarize just a few wider issues about the rise of authoritarianism and the collapse of democracy in India, which the incarcerations reveals to be particularly worrying. So first uh, is the use of cyber warfare to curb democratic rights. So cyber forensic investigations by US experts, um, a company called Arsenal Consulting, um, who got the clone copies of the hard drives that were taken by the police, has shown that the electronic evidence used to incarcerate the BK-16 was implanted on the, their computers. So this is a case in which not only has Pegasus been used to spy on the BK-16, and a case in which their emails and computers have been hacked, but also the evidence that has been used to incarcerate them was implanted on their computers. Now, there's a, like a massive 20,000 word chapter on this in my book, and I don't want to give away any spoilers, but the incarceration also reveals the very shocking ways through which this implantation, implantation was likely to have been done, which is namely through a hacker for hire mercenary gang infrastructure that has clients all over the world, including right here in the city of London, but whose epicenter is in India. Second, this is a targeted state-driven attempt to silence human rights defenders, eventually backed by the highest levels of the government. Third, the BK-16 arrests were used to divert attention away from the Hindutva instigators of the communal riots targeting Dalits at Bhima Koregao. And this marks a more general pattern of how Hindutva terror in the country is going unchecked, while anyone dissenting against the current regime is likely to have their house raided, cases filed against them, and threatened with incarceration. The BK case also reveals how Prime Minister Modi and the RSS, with its many arms, has captured state institutions, including the judiciary, and has at its disposal a set of very draconian anti-terror laws, like the UAPA, which allows it to put dissenters behind bars without any trial. Alongside this is the ability of the regime in power to dominate media narratives. Mainstream media has been co-opted already, and those bold enough to challenge the government narrative are silenced, as is evident with the number of raids on independent news outlets, cases filed against journalists, and their arrest. And finally, what is also revealed through the BKK case is how international economic and financial institutions can be complicit in not only propping up, but also weaponizing a regime that wants to target democratic rights activists. So events like the G G20 summit, which brought together the world's most significant economies, give legitimacy to authoritarian leaders and regimes, and even allow them to co-opt and subvert the meaning of democracy. These are, in some ways, an extension of the welcome and therefore legitimacy Modi received from the US and the UK governments once he came into power as prime minister, despite the fact that he had earlier been banned for good reason. There is also a more insidious role of international financial institutions in repressing human rights defenders. International instruments and bodies that dole out ratings to countries and certify them for foreign investment on the basis of adherence to their guidance, like the Paris-based Financial Action Task Force, FATF, have led to very aggressive domestic counterterrorism policies and legislation. We've seen how India has used the Foreign Contributions and Regulations Act to clamp down on NGOs. More than 20,000 NGOs can now no longer get foreign funding. Many, many, many have had to close down. But we hear much less about how India has used this compliance with this Paris-based agency to make anti-terror laws like the UAPA so draconian that they can be used to imprison journalists, academics, human rights defenders for years with no evidence, no bail, and no trial. As for the BK-16, there is still no sign of any trial more than five years after the first arrests. Most of the BK-16 remain in prison. Less than 3% of those incarcerated under the UAPA are convicted. 
Of course, the harassment, pretrial detention, and lengthy legal quagmires that the BK-16, their families, and their friends, and others like them have to suffer itself is the punishment. You know, in, in the end, they said the process is the punishment. And I'm really honored that some representatives of the BK-16 family are in this room. Thank you for coming. International pressure matters in keeping in check the democratic rights abuses in India, abuses now also reaching foreign soil. It's time to start pointing our fingers to the fact that behind the veil of the world's largest electoral democracy, or mother of democracy, as Modi has been calling the country, there is a powerful authoritarianism, fascism indeed, on the rise. I hope the incarcerations will be able to contribute to the fight for keeping alive the spaces of democracy and justice in India, which matter for everyone globally. Thank you. Thanks very much, Alpha. Over to you, Christoph. Thank you, thank you very much. Well, like others, like many colleagues and like Alpa, definitely, the incarcerations of the Bima Koregao accused affected me personally. I knew some of them, I know some of them, uh, including uh, Anand Teltumbe, whose forthcoming book, by the way, on Ambedkar, will be, I read last week. Arun Ferrara, whose book, Colors of the Cage, I recommend because he has been there before and he can testify. And a few years ago, when um, everyone was silent, we started to interview those who knew them well, their family, relatives, their friends. Cedric Prakash gave a testimony on uh, Stan Swami, uh, Sabah Hussein spoke about Gautam. And then came the project of Alpa. So we stopped because she did the work. The website is still there, but really everything is in her book. And this is why I find this book so important, because it's the best way to know the story, not to forget. And you'll find Alpa's intellectual power as well as courage, because she is very brave. She speaks for those who cannot speak anymore. We speak for those who cannot speak anymore. And we will continue. Well, in the division of labor that we have uh, decided between us, um, I have a small part, and I will not go beyond 10 minutes, to, to contextualize these incarcerations um, in this era of Hindu majoritarianism. And I will do that by focusing on two aspects. One is their defense of caste. The other one is their development of vigilantism. They go together, but we can look at them as separate entry points. Well, of course, we know that they are against Muslims, against minorities. Uh, we more rarely emphasize their defense of caste. And I think we need to revisit this dimension, key dimension of Indodva, that is so fundamental that you don't understand the different phases of the Indodva movement if you miss this. They started RSS in reaction to Ambedkar in the 20s, not only in reaction to Ambedkar, but to a large extent in reaction to Ambedkar in the 20s, in the same place, in Maharashtra, and Maharashtrian Brahmins were, of course, behind this. Then you can see a dialectic between uh, the rise of lower caste, Dalits, OBCs, and new developments of the Indudva strategy. Uh, the CAM coalition started by Solanki in Gujarat was the reason why you had so many riots in Ahmedabad and the making of an alternative Modidva before, before Modi in the 80s already. But of course, the turning point is the Ayodhya movement that was a response 
to the Mondal moment. And in this book, what you understand is the attempt at preventing Dalits from gaining dignity. The starting point is this attack on Dalits who had assembled, as Alpa has just recalled, to commemorate the bicentenary of the victory of Mahars over the Peshwa's army. And this memory is something unbearable that cannot be sustained. Well, this is one indication of the larger picture that I really uh, emphasize once again, the rejection of in the attempt at suppressing the way Dalits, lower caste at large, try to emancipate from the caste system. Because their model and the subtext of Hindutva is social hierarchy vis-a-vis minorities, vis-a-vis low caste people. Suppression is one strategy, that the, what, that, that's the one they used in Bima Koregaon, but Sanskritization, co-option, religiosity is another one. And they go together to diffuse tensions, to, to, to uh, marginalize uh, the attempts at uh, gaining equality, at gaining um, dignity. And, and as Alpa has just reminded us, India has probably never been more unequal. If you look at Piketty's uh, graph last week, we are back to the Raj era, and it's even worse than under the Raj. If you have any doubt about the prejudice, anti-Dalit prejudice of the RSS, just read Banwar Megwani's book, I Could Not Be Hindu. He tried, he went to Ayodhya, he contributed to destroy the Babri Masjid, and then he could never be accepted as one of them, which is a reflection of how deep the prejudice is. So that's really one aspect of the Hindutva movement that this book helps us to understand uh, and, and of course the number of Dalits behind bars is of course a reflection of this. Now, one word about this vigilantism question. As uh, Alpa has just shown by, um, in one of her slides, in January 2018, the attack on the Dalit people, what gathered for this commemoration, were two men, well, were masterminded by two men. You saw the photograph of Sambaji Bide with Padnavis, that was one of the photographs. And you saw the photograph of uh, Milind Egbote, the one who went briefly behind bars. Who are these people? Had you heard of them before? This is where we see another dimension. The vigilantes, those who are doing groundwork for decades, for 100 years, well, RSS will turn 100 years, 100 years old next year. The same groundwork at the grassroots level and they are totally dedicated to the case. Bide is an ascetic in, a, in the true sense of the word, completely dedicated to the cause of Indudva and therefore of this attack on the uh, Dalits. What are they doing? Well, they are doing what I call um, cultural policing. Well, it's what vigilantes do. And we come to know them because of what they do vis-a-vis -vis the Muslims. You know, we have heard that there are now squads patrolling the highways to check the trucks where Muslims may be taking cows 
to the slaughterhouse. We know that they are patrolling the university campuses for making sure that Muslim boys don't speak to Hindu girls. They would so seduce them, they would convert them, they would marry them. This is love jihad. What we have not heard so much about is what they are doing at the ground or at the, at the grassroots level vis-a-vis -vis the caste system. Because the same way they make sure that Hindus and Muslims don't interact, they also make sure that there is no intercaste marriages, there is no intercaste uh, encounters. The Bajrang Dalis, who have been responsible for the pogrom in Gujarat in 2002, had a parallel activity, Babu Bajrangi, for instance, to make sure that the Patel girls who eloped with anyone from another caste could be retrieved. So, vigilantism is a cultural policing that is not only directed towards the promotion of a Hindu dva anti-Muslim agenda, but is also going in the same direction of the attacks on the Dalits. What does it tell us about the um, trajectory of India? Well, it tells us that after episodes of progressive series of measures. We are certainly in this regressive mode, not only politically, of course there is an, uh, an erosion of democracy to use Alpa's words, but there is also a social inversion and both go together. The politics of the state, the BGP ruled state at least, and the social work, the societal work of the vigilantes go together, making something much more substantial that we can imagine. Because BGP may lose elections, they will not retreat. They are now in society. They have now penetrated society. And that's why I call, a, uh, that's what I speak of a deeper state. This is a deeper state, and this book helps us to understand how things are connected. Of course, you have the official state, the formal state, the government, the judiciary, but you have also a sectarian development. And we need to look at these two things together to understand the trajectory of today's India. And once again, this is what this book helps us to understand. Thank you, Alpa, again. <laughs>
battle of Bhima Koregaon, therefore, is not a straightforward fight against a colonial power. Uh, it is also a battle for recognition in which subjugated Mahars overthrow the Peshwa oppressor. There are several accounts in literature about the persecution of Peshwas, the Peshwa persecution of former untouchable castes. I'm going to quote one, which is, in 1855, a 15-year-old Mukta Salve, uh, who was the student of Jyotiba Phule, she shared her experience of her caste being subjugated by the Peshwas. She belonged to the Mang caste, another former untouchable caste. Let that religion where only one person is privileged and the rest are deprived perish from the earth and let it never enter our minds to be proud of such a religion. These people drove us, the poor Mangs and Mahars, away from our own lands, which they occupied to build large mansions. That was not all. They regularly used to make the Mangs and Mahars drink oil mixed with red lead and then buried them in the foundations of their mansions, thus wiping out generation after generation of these poor people. Under Baji Rao's rule, if any Mang or Mahar happened to pass in front of the gymnasium, they cut off his head and used it to play bat ball with their swords as bats and his head as a ball. Peshwa atrocities against low caste people have remained ingrained in public memory. A regime that also denied physical, occupational and social mobility, which However, they were able, th that was available to them with the East India Company, at least initially. In uh, 1921, Dr. Baba Sahib Ambedkar was invited to Bhima Koregaon, where he supported this idea of making an annual pilgrimage to the site. Over time, the Battle of Bhima Koregaon came to be re-signified by Dalit communities, not as a colonial triumph uh, over a native kingdom, but as a movement, like uh, Dr. Christoph said, for the emancipation of former untouchable castes. And it also was a uh, time for them to mark Baba Sahib Ambedkar's visit to Bhima Koregaon as well. Uh, the book also mentions, and I would urge you, there is a fabulous doc documentary by Somnath Vagmare on YouTube that's available, which is about Bhima Koregaon. What that celebration of, uh, in 2017, when that documentary was shot, about 30 to 40 lakh people attended that. What that sea of white and blue looks like, how celebratory and how with hope that place uh, is. Uh, how bookshops crop up, spring up on the roadside uh, that, uh, that make available affordable uh, anti-caste progressive literature. Uh, there are street plays, theater, there is the cries of Jai Bheem all over. Uh, it is, there's music in the air and, and there's a lot of hope. The book, and as, Alpa, as Dr. Alpa has al also said, that the events of 1st January 2018 uh, was when hundreds and thousands of people were marching towards Bhima Koregaon and a mob of 2,000 men, which was a premeditated plan uh, of 2,000 men, uh, waving saffron flags, carrying Molotov cocktails, uh, launched a riot. And there were many casualties. Uh, Mangal Kamble, a lady who had a tea shop to provide snacks for people, pilgrims who were coming there. Her shop was burnt down and her house was burnt down. Suresh Sakat's eatery was also burnt down. And her, his 19-year-old daughter, Pooja, uh, who witnessed this violence, was later on drowned in a well. Anita Savle was one of the people who was caught in the riot but managed to escape. And she filed the only first information report with the Pune police. Uh, against Sambhaji Bhagat, as we've seen the pictures, and Milind Ekbote. Um, one month into that investigation, Milind Ekbote wa walked out on bail. Sambhaji Bhagat never, was never taken into custody. Anita Savle's FIR, the first information report, kind of disappeared, vanished, despite her following up. And what happened to her? Uh, she was, this, she faced a lot of direct and indirect torture. 
Uh, the seats of her scooters would be mysteriously slashed. There were leaflets circulated in her neighborhood that uh, uh, somebody should file a case against her. There was a Facebook video that went viral that called for the assassination of the lady who filed an FIR. Anita Savle was a Dalit woman, and it was possible to do uh, this sort of direct and indirect torture. In place of Anita Savle's FIR, there appeared a new FIR in which the sequence of events has, had changed and the perpetrators were completely different. And uh, the perpetrators who were named in this new FIR were the Elgar Parishad, Kabir Kalam Manch, uh, a lot of the people from the BK-16, Mahesh Raut, Surendra Gardling, um, Shoma Sen, Sudhir Dhavle, my, uh, and Professor Anand Tel Tumde. Later on, uh, eight migrant workers from Telangana who were part of the Mumbai Electronic Employees Union uh, were arrested because some of them had gone to Bhima Koregaon on January 1st. And uh, the union had taken on Reliance Energy, which was owned by Anil Ambani at that time, and Gautam Adani had acquired it by the end of 2017. They were fighting for regularization, better wages, safety, uh, and eight of these workers from this union were arrested under UAPA, uh, which is the Draconian Terror Act. Who were these entities and these people, and why were they named in the Bhima Koregaon BK-16 case? So, okay, I, I'm so sorry. I'm running so <laughs> slow. So I'll quickly tell you about Elgar Parishad, which was a cross-caste gathering of uh, more than 30,000 people, Dalits, other backward classes, Adivasis, Muslims, and Marathas, brought together by 250 organizations uh, to loudly appeal to the people against Kasti's communal forces. Um, Kabir Kala Manch are Lok Shahir's people's poets who, whose poignant ballads are on hunger, unemployment, homelessness, religious harmony, and on students. What the book is so meticulously bringing to attention is that there was an emergence of cross-caste solidarity among working classes that you could see at places like Bhima Koregao, that you could see at Elgar Parishad, Kabir Kala Manch, Vidrohi Sahitya Sammelan, and in trade unions in Bombay, which was being construed as a direct threat to a Hindutva regime and neoliberal capitalism. I mean, in, like as we head into elections, like Dr. Alpa said, like we often, we, I mean, I'm asking myself, what is the alternative? A lot of people I know ask, what is the alternative? This is the alternative. Elgar Parishad is the alternative. Uh, I will end with Professor Anantel Tumre, who has been a fierce critic uh, of Hindutva, and of the neoliberal order and the position of Dalits in that system. What does he say? Dalits are as the biggest victims of this hydra-headed monster are the most critical constituents of this struggle. This monster has not only devastated their livelihood, but also destroyed any hope of their emancipation. Unfortunately, they are yet to realize the magnitude of the damage done. The vested interests among them have significantly misled them into believing that globalization holds emancipatory promise for them, or Hindutva seeks to accept Dalits into a society sans caste. Nothing could be farther from the truth. Neoliberal globalization neither believes in any such thing as emancipation or equality or fraternity, nor does it have the capacity to provide relief to its victim. It is impossible for Hindutva to abolish caste without discarding its real, real religio-cultural structure. Moreover, there is no evidence that it intends to do so. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now we hand over to Tatran Katan. Thank you very much, and I'm delighted to be on this panel because this is a fantastic book. Every one of you should read it, buy a copy, and get it signed by Alpa. This is a story of human courage and passion for justice, as well as a story for the human capacity for vileness and debasement. And it's, it's an age-old story of the fight between power and, and power and justice. 
a story that needs to be told uh, time and again. And Alpa has told it beautifully, elegantly, and extremely meticulously. So I really commend the book. It's one of the best books I've read in a long time. Um, I'm a lawyer. And what I want to pick up from the book is its deep and complicated engagement with the law and the Indian Constitution. And let me start with a few quotations from the various heroes that the book tells the story of. This is Tan Swami. This is, this is a bit that Alpa read in her opening remarks as well. I wanted justice to be done to them as per the constitutional provisions in Supreme Court's judgments. Sudha Bharadwaj, the fact that we tried to make the whole process understandable to the people, make intelligible what was happening legally, what their constitutional rights were, what the steps were in fighting for them that made a big difference. Alpa recounts the concrete slabs erected in villages in Jharkhand with constitutional provisions inscribed on them, echoing their sacred status, um, which were previously used for worship. Anita Sawale that Priyanka mentioned decided that because they were followers of Dr. Ambedkar, they should respect the Constitution of India and hold a peaceful protest. The Elgar Parishad's meeting ended with a pledge by the audience to defend the Indian Constitution. Somwari, an Adivasi activist that Alpa speaks of, who was tortured and sexually assaulted, said, I'll, I'll ignore the description of the torture, uh, when they did this to me, I did not abandon the path set out in our constitution. When they killed my husband or attacked my house or compelled my mother to die, I never left the path of the constitution. Gautam Navlakha became the convener of a civil society initiative called People's Movement for Secularism, which focused on the need to uphold the secular values enshrined in the Constitution of India. Varavara Rao and Vernon were running English classes and teaching inmates in the Yaravada prison about the Constitution. What explains this constitutional faith of all of these defenders of, of liberty, of rights, of justice, of a sense of morality and public civic duties in the Indian Constitution? It's far from a perfect document. The only dissenter amongst Alpa's heroes is Anil Teltumre, who says, you beg for bail, and the courts will reject your petition as historical data shows that the average period of incarceration ranged from four to 10 years before you got bail or got acquittal. This can happen literally to anyone. In the name of the nation, such draconian laws that denude innocent people of their liberties and all constitutional rights are constitutionally validated. Tel Tumre also speaks of Dr. Ambedkar's own ambivalence attitude to the constitution that he himself helped design. So there's a deep ambivalence about the Indian constitution, which is at once revered, as well as one that facilitates, at least in part, what happened to the BK-16. And I think the explanation is that the Indian constitution has three distinct dimensions, in my view. On the one hand, we have the moral constitution, the constitution of the preamble, the constitution that seeks to uphold rarefied principle, aspirational values of equality and liberty and justice and fraternity and dignity of the individual. This is the constitution that acts, that has acted as not just a moral register, but the moral register for most of the political life of independent India. Rohit Day's recent book on the people's constitution talks about how the progressive left's general theoretical disdain for the rule of law and liberal rights on Western campuses was never really apparent in the practice of progressive politics in India, which largely remained wedded to this moral register of constitutionalism in the work of people like Stan Swami and Sudha Bharadwaj and Gautam Navlakha and so many others, people who are the heroes of this excellent book. But at the same time, the same constitution also has an authoritarian register, a register that is a late entrant 
into the Constitution during its drafting process being made as it was in the crucible of the violence of partition and the anarchic bloodletting from which the lesson that the Constitution framers derived was we need a strong state. This is, this is what, when you look at the nuts and bolts of this Constitution, a deviation from its moral vision in hushed tones, as an embarrassment, qualified with caveats, but authoritarian nonetheless, provisions which permit the preventive detention of people before they have done anything wrong, provisions that permit the state to tell citizens what they can eat and what they can drink, provisions that allow the central government to appoint governors to oversee elected state governments, provisions that allow for extensive emergency powers and restrictions on freedoms. This is the constitution that permitted some of the excesses visited upon the BK-16 by the state. But this internal disharmony, this polyphony of the Indian constitution embodies the contradictions of Indian political life. But this wasn't an equal polyphony. The constitution made a clear choice, the louder, soaring, hand on heart, solemn voice that professed adherence to the best values of humanity was the dominant hegemonic voice the aspirational voice, the voice where the Constitution would like to end up, the hushed, embarrassed, muttered under the breath voice, the one that spoke in caveats and qualifications that compromised from values in the name of pragmatism and the distinctive Indian conditions, that was definitely the junior player. And the hope was that it will eventually become unnecessary. The contestation that we have seen about and over the Constitution in the last 10 years has been a contestation that has sought to reverse the relationship, the hierarchical relationship between the two voices, a contestation that has made the authoritarian, silent, subtle voice increasingly dominant, increasingly shameless, unabashed, loud, cheering from the roof rooftops. a voice that is no longer ashamed of these deviations. In fact, a voice that sees the moral register as the one that should be shame-making. So as Alpa said, and as the book excellently demonstrates, India is going through its second most serious crisis in its constitutional history, where the rarefied aspirational moral constitution has been in, under threat like never before. Even during Indira Gandhi's emergency, while the authoritarian constitution dominated in fact, the primacy of the moral register was never questioned discursively. Today, the threat to the moral register is existential. Only last week, we saw the ruling regime imprison an elected chief minister from an opposition party under a law inspired by international institutions, by the way, the Prevention of Money Laundering Act. Only last week we saw the freezing of bank accounts of India's largest opposition party just before elections is unable to pay a penny to fight for elections. Clearly motivated to gain that supermajority that will facilitate the replacement, the evisceration of the moral register India is one election away from the discursive hegemony of its moral constitution and the establishment of the authoritarian one as the only one that matters. Alpa has narrated so beautifully that there will be heroes who will no doubt continue to fight for this moral constitution, whatever the cost, and keep hope alive. But before I end, I also want to say that in telling their story, Alpa herself has stood up unflinchingly for the moral constitution of India. So please join me in thanking her for being so true to her vocation and so eloquently speaking truth to power and to document the truth for posterity.
Thank you very much to you and to all of the speakers. So we're going to take some questions from the floor, and we also take some questions from the online audience. Um, we'll start off with the floor. <coughs> Can you please identify who you are? <coughs> uh, we've got around about 25 minutes or so. And I think I might take a few at a time. Is that all right? Sure. Okay. All right, so there's one right at the back over there, and then that one over there, and then this one. I'll take three, and then we'll answer. Thank you. Thank you very much for the... Does that work? Yes. Thank you very much for those powerful presentations. My name's Tricia Rogers, and I'm from the United Nations Association, London and Southeast Region. And I've um, been very moved by both the book and the description of it. And I wonder if you could advise us if there's anything useful we can do in lobbying either the British government or the United Nations to help address the situation. Thank you. Thanks. And there's one um, right at the back over there. Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Gokul. I'm a student here at LSE. Uh, so I was, uh, so for me, this case uh, represented like uh, the way that the mobilization of the term urban Nuxle and how it came into parliament. So I was wondering if you could speak to about how the knowledge presented by professors is just cheapened and then criminalized through incarceration and things like that. And then there's one, I think it was you. Um, sorry, there's one over here. If you can just come here, thanks. Hello, my name is Latika Singha, and thank you for the yeah, wonderful uh, panel. Uh, I'm a member of the questioning public, and I would like to, my question is maybe particularly directed to Christopher, but um, open to anyone. I want to ask about the fact that you, you mentioned, you know, that vigilantism is sort of aiming at two populations here, the Dalits and the Muslims. But we also know that a lot, majority of Muslims in India are actually lower caste converts to escape untouchability. And I wondered if you could comment on that in relation to the Bhim Koregaon case. Thank you. Great, thanks. Okay, Alfred, would you like to? Thanks, yeah. Thanks for your questions. Um, in terms of what we can do here, I mean, there's a lot. <laughs> Um, you know, just, you know, calling our governments to account for, lo for closing up um, with the Modi regime is something that we all have to shine a, shine a light on. Um, uh, I think there's, like, very specific things that can be done. I mean, um, for example, the Financial Action Task Force, this Paris-based um, uh, group, which is actually... Uh, at the moment undertaking a review of its um, activities and how they impact India on the ground. It's about to produce a report in June 2024, this, this, this June. Um, you know, many civil liberties groups in India have been highlighting the, the unintended consequences of their money laundering anti-terror um, policies and how that's actually being used to um, incarcerate journalists, human rights defenders, academics in, in India, not just in, in India, elsewhere as well. And, and you know, they're refusing to take into account these civil liberties voices. So there's a lot of kind of lobbying that can be done, especially at that level, because these are bodies that are based here um, uh, in, you know, in the West. Um, to listen to civil liberties groups and to take their reports seriously. Um, and I think that can have a big impact on, on how anti-terror law is being strengthened through these international financial instruments. Um, that's, a big, that's a big thing that nobody's talking about, nobody's like taking on. Um, the urban Naxal uh, category, yes. Um, so for those of you who, who don't know, Naxalites are um, also referred, the, the term Naxalite refers to this Marxist-Leninist, Maoist insurgency that has been in India, going on in India for the last 50 years. Um, they have been abandoned India and they are labeled terrorists and that's what my first book was about, about, um, about, about the Naxalites. And many, many Naxalites are in prison, many Adivasis are in prison as Naxalites. Uh, the jails of Central and India, Eastern India are full of uh, people imprisoned as alleged Naxalites, no trial, no, no bail. But what's unusual about this case um, uh, is that, uh, or, or what, why this case marked a difference between what was happening in the past, is that those people who were trying to get out 
Adivasis, Dalits incarcerated as alleged Naxalites in all of these remote areas of India who would never have any legal, re legal representation, who would never have any legal voice. The people who were getting them, them, them out of jail are now themselves targeted as urban Naxal. And of course, urban Naxal has then become a term that has been just used willy-nilly uh, all over the country to target anybody that's dissenting against the government. It's been used to, and you know, you, we've had these kind of counterintuitive movements as well, where, where people are saying, okay, if that person is an axel, there was this like, I remember there was this surge on Twitter at one point, you know, where, where it's like, okay, if that person, if Sudha Bhardwaj is an axel, me too, uh, urban axel, you know, it was, it's become, a, it's become a, it's become actually a, a, um, a, a title of pride to where, in fact, a friend just sent me a, a little video um, <laughs> wishing me luck, a friend who lives in Delhi, um, wishing me luck for the launch, and she had this little um, urban Naxal mug on <laughs> that she was drinking coffee from that morning, you know, what kind of a Naxal are you? Are you a Bourbon Naxal? Are you an urban Naxal? You know, so it's become, so it's a, it's a term that's used to incarcerate people, but it's also a term that's now being used um, for those people who are resisting the regime in power and, you know, to make, um, yeah, to, 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 to make fun out of what's happening um, as a way to yeah, relieve, uh, relieve the seriousness of what's going on, yeah. Do you want to ask, answer the question? Very about quickly, but uh, um, yes, there is caste among minorities as well, uh, among Muslims, among, among Christians, and they have to be fought among minorities as well. What is interesting in the case of the Muslims is that because of the kind of oppression they are now submitted to, you see a convergence between lower caste and, and upper caste. And the last figures, the, the last data is really astonishing because the upper caste Muslims are declining so quickly in terms of wealth, in terms of education, in North India, of course, huh? Uttar Pradesh, we are. That now, those who are called Asmandas, lower caste Muslims, and upper caste Muslims are almost on the same page. When on the contrary, of course, on the Hindu side, class and caste do not coincide. Uh, well, I mean, you see a class difference because of caste differences. This is, this is something that results in less discrimination within the Muslims because when you have to close ranks, that's what you do. And this is exactly what ghettoization produces because the rich and the poor have to be together. The high and the low have to be together because of safety. A ghetto is the same in Warsaw in the 20s, and in India in the, uh, well, 20s again, but 100 years later. And, and you see how uh, you, you, you just forget differences, inner differences to close ranks. Great, thank you. So um, I've got Johnny, and I'll take you, and then um, over there at the back, and then we'll do another round. Johnny? Yeah. Here's, um, a, here's a microphone. What's your name? <laughs> uh, Johnny Parry is superannuated. Um, the Indian state, it seems to me, is not monolithic. The police in Pune uh, don't necessarily very much like the police in Delhi and so on and so forth, yet they manage to go and arrest all these people all over India. They don't necessarily like the prison service, the judiciary, uh, the civil administration, so there are lots of competing interests there. So I'm wondering where are the whistleblowers in this whole picture? You know, the Catherine Guns of, uh, of India. Um, why is, uh, you know, large numbers of officials must be involved in this conspiracy. They know bloody well that these are trumped up completely fabricated charges. So, okay, I'm perfectly well aware that you can transfer civil service servant servants to, you know, outer space, Garcharoli or wherever, uh, and you can make their lives pretty uncomfortable. But Indian civil servants are extraordinarily, by world standards, I would say, secure. They are also, by the standards of most Indians, extremely well paid. And even if they sit at home, they will go on drawing their salaries for 20 years when an inquiry takes place. 
So I want to know why we are not hearing about anybody who's objecting to all this, particularly given Professor Jaffrelo's point about, uh, about the Dalits. How many Dalits are now represented in government posts? Thank they you. They can't be happy. Okay, two, two, two along from you. There's somebody here who wants to ask a question as well. Thank you so much. That, that it has been Sorry, really what's your name? <laughs> the mic's working. Uh, I'm Leila Kadiwal. I am lecturer at UCL, and I am from Garchiroli, Alpha. <laughs> <laughs> um, my question is uh, Israel model. So if you could speak to the relationship between the far right of India and the far right of Israel, and what does the discourse of Israel model mean in India? Thank you. And there's one at the back over there, the lady with the purple jumper. Yes, thank you. My name is Carmen Playfair. I I'm, I'm have nothing to do with the LSE. I come here to be educated. I'm a hospital doctor and a lawyer. Can the panel please explain to me how a man like Narendra Modi, who used to run a tea stall on the side of the road in Delhi with his brother, could have changed India so much in the last 10 years, <coughs> not very highly educated, and is now going for a third term, revered by the people. This morning, Al Jazeera showed the India Report, a documentary about how he abuses the Central Bureau of Investigation, destroyed its independence, and uses the law to put 90% of the opposition people in jail for money laundering. How is this possible? Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks. Over to you. Take them in uh, reverse order. Um, I think the, the thing uh, to highlight is there's a real difference between you know, Narendra Modi as a strong man and, say, uh, Trump as a strong man. Um, and that is that Narendra Modi has behind him, as Christophe Jaffrolo mentioned, a hundred year old history of organization organizations that have been working in different parts of the country on different sectors uh, who have been taking you know who have been undertaking a slow project of the takeover of the country so there are you know student unions in the universities that are attached to the hindu right there are trade unions there are farmers movements there are there is a whole project of developing building schools across the country that is part of this project of Hindu, Hindu nationalism. There, nationalism. There are organizations here in England, in the diaspora, that are associated with what's happening, uh, with, that, are, that, are, that are associated with the Sangh Parivar, the family of organizations um, to which Narendra Modi belongs. Yeah. He's a, yeah so, so I think that's like, you cannot expl explain what's happening right now uh, through just looking at the figure of Modi. You have to understand that huge history of organization that slides behind him. Sorry, Tarun. Finish up. No, no. Response to the first question. Oh, oh, it's the first one. Okay, fine. Carry on. With yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, so um, the, the, the far right of Israel and the far right of India, I mean, I think that will need a separate study. <laughs> yes. um, but, you know, there is a lot of, um, uh, I mean, in the book, there is, I, I have this chapter on cyber forensics where there is a direct relationship between Netanyahu and Modi and the deals that they have struck um, on cyber warfare and digital technologies and... Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so that there, there's definitely you know a direct relationship between between the two men, but that would have to be this, I think, a separate study. Um, and Johnny's question. And Johnny's question, yeah, Johnny. I mean, I think that's where the hope lies, you know, in the fact that uh, there is resistance within the state. I mean, one of the really interesting things that um, uh, that appears again in the cyber forensics chapter is. Um, is my interviews with the top cyber forensic uh, people who are looking at this case in the US and they were like basically saying, you know, it's the reason why we've been, we've been able to find out what happened is because it was like such a shoddy job. It was done in such a bad way. There were so many discrepancies. There were people arguing with each other, you know, so there, there's basically a... Um, um, uh, you know, the fact that the Indian state doesn't operate in this monolithic 
monolithic way, um, which I think you know you're 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 totally right. But then at the same time, we have to remember the extreme silencing that has happened at, in this case. So the fact that when you know the judges who spoke out against the Gujarat riots, you know when 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 they you know th we've had assassinations, uh, we've had you know people disappearing, we've had police officers put in jail, you know right. right especially, again, thinking about the Gujarat riots. So there is a self-silencing that's going on, too, uh, a very serious self-silencing. So even if there is uh, the potential for whistleblowers, um, yeah, there's, uh, it's, it's not easy. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Saran, you had, a, you had a point. I just wanted to elaborate on, on uh, Alpa's answer to the last question. So Sanjeev Bhatt, an exactly. Indian police service officer, uh, claimed after the Gujarat riots that he was in the room when Narendra Modi gave orders for the police to stand by and allow the Hindu mobs to kill the Muslims. Um, he lost his job, got embroiled in cases, and is now serving life imprisonment for murder. Um, Justice Loya, Justice just before deciding a criminal trial, trial against, the, against Modi's um, sort of Man Friday, um, Ahmed Shah, in a murder case, was found mysteriously dead. So the cost, and this is what's unusual about, we've seen democratic decline across the world in the last 10 years. India stands out for a number of reasons, but two of them have been uh, just the enormous use of violence, both, both through the law and outside the law, which is unusual. It's not been seen in Hungary or Poland or some of the other places. And the second is the complete capture of the media ecosystem through the client capitalists, uh, where there is almost no television media voice that's independent. So even the huge corruption disclosure last, last week about the electoral bonds is barely making a dent in the public perception of Modi because the media has blocked, black, blocked it out. Thank you. <clears throat> I've got two questions from on the online <coughs> excuse me, audience. So the first question is uh, to Professor Kaitan from an anonymous user. Uh, does Indian constitution not have enough safeguards to resist the changes? For example, the basic structure doctrine. Um, second question is from Mina Danda. Uh, can we expect any agency of the state to be made answerable for taking away years from people's lives? Will the moral constitution have any traction in setting right the rampant miscarriage of justice? Who would like to address that? Do you want to take a round? Or? Um, oh, sorry, yeah. So there's two questions there, and there was one, I think, here. Yeah. Would you like... Okay, here we are. Hi, my name is Praveen Kolaguri. I'm part of a collective called India Labour Solidarity. And uh, my question is uh, to Professor Shah and others, as well as uh, uh, Dr. Teltumde in his recent writings has warned that India is facing its last free election as a democracy. What, what are your views on that? Okay, so we've got three questions. Um, do you wanna, who would like to answer them? I'm do happy wanna, to. Go. So, um, the basic structure doctrine is a doctrine evolved by the Indian Supreme Court uh, to say that certain fundamental features of the Constitution, like democracy, secularism, are unamendable. Um, if the last 10 years have taught us anything, it is that the Constitution will not be saved in the courts. Every single governmental agency bar two have rolled over. Um, sometimes because they're scared, sometimes because they've been bought out, sometimes because they have been ideological cheerleaders of the Modi regime. The only exceptions have been the upper chamber, uh, which was dominated, until it was dominated by the opposition, and federalism, states that were opposition controlled. The moral of the story is, the only hope is politicians, not courts. The constitution will be saved on the streets if it is to survive through politics not through law, so I don't, and I, I say this as a lawyer, uh, we, we cannot expect, and on the accountability question, you know, hopefully, but uh, I don't agree, I, I don't know, when Anand said uh, what he did about the last free elections, I don't think these elections are free, uh, and certainly not fair. Mm. And there might be a case for the opposition to consider boycotting them. 
Do you want to add something? No, I mean, I, I think I think that's right. I mean, you know, that I, I, I'm not sure when Anand Tumde has said this, but, um, you know, elections will keep going on. You know, there's no need to get rid of them. It's just going to be a, a ritual um, which takes place whenever it does, you know, and it's just going to have no bearing uh, um, in, in many, many states which are completely controlled by the RSS now. Um, so, yeah, there's no... There's no need, and that's why I think Darren talks about boycotting them. Yeah. So we've got a couple of minutes left. Um, would you like to say anything else? Just a word on these, because it's very interesting to compare what we see elsewhere, including in Turkey's uh, Erdogan's Turkey and uh, Netanyahu's Israel. You know, we have politicians who are populist, national populist, and who need elections for getting some legitimacy. You know, in, in that sense, it's not what we saw in the 30s in Europe. No coup. Elections, every five years, elections. You, know, you need elections because that, that gives you legitimacy for prevailing. I am the people. If I am the people, the tyranny of the, of the unelected, uh, as uh, our own, um, who said that? Uh, forget, but one of the ministers, uh, the, the unelected is tyrannical because it is the judiciary, uh, arrangedly, arrangedly said it, yeah. So the question is, is the opposition not making a mistake by making this um, charade of democracy uh, giving legitimacy to the rulers? And that's a question that may probably now being even more legitimate because if you put chief ministers behind bars and good orators behind bars, then you make the field even more, well, the, the even playing field is a foregone story. That's a new development. I think, uh, yeah, you're right, Darren. Uh, that's a turning point, P possibly <coughs> a turning point. Okay, we've run out of time. Um, you are all invited, first of all, to go and have a look at the exhibition, which is upstairs in the old building up opposite here which is also Alpha and many of her postdocs, some of whom are here at the moment. Um, and it's called Invisible India, right? And also the, there's a reception, I think, right outside. Yeah, come and have a glass of wine and, and, yeah, and mingle. Get your book as well. So thank you very much thank to you. Alpha and to all of you. <laughs>